All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to take it back a couple decades, and we're going to brew one of the pioneering styles of the American craft beer revolution, the West Coast IPA. first time here I just want to say welcome to you thanks for checking out this channel here on this channel I'll typically do either a grain to glass video like the one you're watching right now or I'll do a shorter video on various different topics about home brewing if you like either of those things please like this video and hit that subscribe button for more content like this so the West Coast IPA was like the original craft IPA style in America it's the kind of beer that really spurred forward the American craft beer revolution uh, over the last several decades one of the beers that I think really brings forth the essence of what a West Coast IPA really is, is Sierra Nevada Torpedo IPA. Oh, you know, West Coast IPA, we're shooting for a beer that has a tremendous amount of hop character and a lot of assertive bitterness, but not so much that it makes your face melt. We're looking for a decent amount of bitterness, more so than most other types of beers, but paired with a moderate amount of malt sweetness, as well as a tremendous amount of hop flavor and aroma. When done right, a West Coast IPA will really have a tremendous amount of expression in its hop character. Their hop character can be very refreshing, very piney and zesty and citrusy and grapefruit uh, heavy. I think we've officially gotten to that point where when we hear IPA, we think hazy New England IPA instead of West Coast IPA. But there was, believe it or not, a time where the West Coast IPA was the only kind of IPA available. <laughs> it had its heyday about 10 years ago, and after that, the hazy and juicy New England IPA started to really kind of become the more trendy beer style. So what really makes a West Coast IPA different from like a hazy or an East Coast or New England IPA? Well, first of all is the appearance, it's the haze, it's the uh, overall cloudiness of a uh, East Coast IPA. West Coast IPAs are typically very clear beers, in fact. Uh, for the most part, unless they're heavily dry hopped, they're going to be pretty clear. The next thing that's very different about them is mouthfeel. West Coast IPAs are going to feel very dry. There's going to be a little bit of residual sweetness in some of them, uh, but for the most part, they're going to be pretty dry, whereas the New England IPAs have a pretty high finishing gravity. They tend to be pretty, uh, they tend to be fairly sweet and uh, have a very full-bodied mouthfeel. Both types of IPAs are, in fact, very powerfully flavored. Uh, there's a lot of hop character in both types of IPA. It just manifests itself differently. The most notable difference is that in a West Coast IPA, there's a substantial amount of bitterness, where in the East Coast IPA, the objective is to get rid of as much bitterness as possible, to leave only the juicy and the fruity flavors. Whereas in the West Coast style, you're focusing on that bitterness, but you're also taking advantage of it. They're gonna end up with like more citrus and pine and grapefruit kind of character uh, than anything else. Also, the West Coast IPAs tend to have a little bit more malt complexity. From time to time, you'll see different types of crystal malts or darker colored malts added to the grist. So there's a little bit of sweetness, sometimes a little bit of color in these IPAs. There's a lot of different ways you can make a West Coast IPA, but today we're going to be kind of basing this recipe off of a recipe that was made by Scott Janish. If you're curious about the recipe I'm basing this off of, I'm going to link it in the description box. It's a publicly available recipe uh, called West Coast IPA Number no. 2, uh, again by Scott Janish. I've actually done minimal modification to this recipe. I changed a couple of the ingredients and I changed a couple of the points where I'm adding certain hops, but other than that, it's actually very similar, so it should be interesting to see how this plays out. Before we get too much further into this video though, I want to thank Northern Brewer for providing me the ingredients to uh, brew this batch of beer with. If you're not familiar with Northern Brewer, they're one of the original homebrew supply stores out there and they're actually one of the first ones to ever take it to the internet. Unfortunately, several years ago, Northern Brewer was purchased by AB InBev, also known as Anheuser-Busch. But let me be the first to tell you that Northern Brewer is no longer owned by AB InBev. They really are responsible for getting the word of homebrewing out there and helping people get started back in the late 90s and the early 2000s and all the way up to now. They have a fantastic selection of hard to find ingredients and top of the line equipment. So if you're shopping for ingredients for your next batch or your next piece of home brewing equipment, before you go anywhere else, check out northernbrewer.com. All right, so onto the recipe. We're starting out with 12 and a half pounds of pearl malt. Um, I actually had a great experience using pearl malt when I made my heady topper clone. It was actually a fantastic base malt for that particular beer, so I would like to use it again. On top of that, we're adding a half a pound of Carafoam and a half a pound of Caramunic One. Carafoam should act very similar to Carapils. Uh, it adds a little bit of extra head retention uh, without impacting the flavor too much. Caramunic is gonna add a nice touch of color and a nice touch of sweetness. 
uh, which is going to balance out the pretty aggressive bitterness that we're going to get in this style. So now we're going to talk about hops. So for starters, we're going to bitter at 60 minutes with one ounce of Columbus. Then uh, we're going to let the boil continue all the way up until five minutes from the end where we'll add half an ounce of Simcoe. Then we're going to start to infuse these nice piney, resinous, uh, citrusy, grapefruity type flavors into the beer with a whirlpool. A whirlpool, also known as a hop stand, is where we add hops to the beer and when it's sitting at a specific temperature, typically about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and we let it sit there. This step extracts a tremendous amount of oils out of the hops and adds a lot of aromatics and flavor without actually volatilizing them uh, as you would during the boil. So we're going to do a 30 minute whirlpool at 180 degrees Fahrenheit with 2 ounces of Centennial and 2 ounces of Citra. Then once fermentation is complete, and here's one of the other key differences between the West and the East Coast IPAs, uh, we're not going to dry hop until fermentation is over. So at the very end of fermentation, we're tossing in two ounces of Cascade, two ounces of Simcoe, and one ounce of Citra. We're going to dry hop for probably about five days, and then we're going to take the dry hops out of the beer and package. For our yeast, we're going to use American Ale yeast that is going to be US05. It's everyone's favorite dry yeast. Uh, it's a great dry yeast. It ferments very cleanly at a variety of temperatures, and I have no issues with it. So now for our water profile, we're aiming for a water profile that accentuates uh, dryness and bitterness of hops. It also will allow the hops to pop out and be a lot brighter overall. If I was doing a New England IPA, I would change a lot about the recipe, but the most important thing would probably be the water profile, in fact. If you're interested in that type of IPA, go check out this video, which I'm going to link up here in the corner, where I break down how that water profile affects the beer. So for the water profile, I'm doing 93 parts per million of calcium, 21 parts per million of magnesium, 5 parts per million of sodium, 52.8 parts per million of chloride, 216 parts per million of sulfate, and 5 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that profile, I'm actually starting out with spring water this time because I kind of want a little additional hardness. Uh, most spring water should be about the same if you're building up a water profile off of it. Uh, some of them may be slightly different. However, for the most part, you're going to see minimal concentration of, of brewing minerals, uh, but you're going to get a lot of different additional minerals that may benefit your beer. Um, I'm adding to eight gallons of spring water, eight grams of gypsum, five grams of epsom, and three grams of calcium chloride. For our mash, we're going to keep this one on the low side of things. We're going to mash at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit for about 60 minutes. That should give us a very fermentable wort uh, that should dry out quite nicely and provide a, a good base for this IPA. So anyway, I'm really looking forward to getting this brew day started. Uh, again, it's one of my favorite kinds of beer, so I really do hope that I make a good one here today. And uh, with that being said, our mash water is up to temp, so let's go ahead and go in. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bell, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash, and I had a few. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes, and then I took a pH measurement, and I saw a measurement of 5.3, which was reasonably on target. So then I let the mash continue sitting at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, and then I raised to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 more minutes, and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for probably another 15 minutes. As soon as I did that, however, I did fire up the controller to 100% power to reduce the time it takes to get to a boil. And then I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and I recorded a measurement of 13.5 bricks or 1053. This was 5 points lower than the target pre-boil gravity. As soon as the wort reached a boil, I tossed in my bittering hops that was 1 ounce of Columbus. Then I let the boil continue for another 45 minutes. At the 15 minute mark, I added a Whirlflock tablet, some yeast nutrient, and then began to recirculate boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it. Uh, this is always just the best way to ensure that your chilling system is sanitary uh, by boiling the inside of it. Then about 10 minutes later, I added my five minute hop addition. Uh, it was half an ounce of Simcoe. Um, and then once the boil ended, I reduced the wort temperature to 180 Fahrenheit for my Whirlpool. So then I added my Whirlpool hops. That was two ounces each of Centennial and Citra. I let them stay in the Whirlpool for about 30 minutes, and then I began the chilling process. I let the wort chill down to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I aerated by splashing into my anvil bucket fermenter. After this, I pitched my yeast.
and I took an OG sample and recorded an original gravity of about 15 bricks, or uh, that was about 1060, uh, which was actually about five points short of the target OG, but still pretty good for the day. All right, so the brew day went pretty well overall. Unfortunately, my camera corrupted the memory card um, as I was filming the Whirlpool edition. So I'm sorry, but that's some actual extra stock footage from another brew day. I apologize for not having the actual footage from this brew day, but it's the same exact process. The fermentation on this beer is gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, with this particular yeast, I usually like to ferment beers at about 65 to 68 degrees. Uh, if you go a little higher than that, you're probably going to be okay, but you could start to kind of squeak out some bananas and fruity esters from the yeast, which would not be really welcome in this type of beer style. Um, and it can kind of ruin things, so just be careful with that. I like to keep it, like I said, 65 to 68. It usually gets me the cleanest possible character out of US05. If you want to use alternative yeast for this particular beer style, um, there's a lot of different options. Uh, really, you could really use pretty much any ale yeast you want to. Um, but my particular recommendations would be, A, if you don't have temperature control and it's the middle of the summer, try using Quike. Uh, so probably like Voss Quike would be really great for this, or maybe some Lutra if you want a super clean character. Um, but there's plenty of different Quike strains out there that are going to give you um, a great, clean, well-attenuated uh, well attenuated beer uh, without needing to worry about temperature. Another alternative would be Imperial Dry Hop. Uh, I actually have a packet of that in the fridge right now, but I just wanted to use the USO5 for this one because it's dry yeast and it's easy. But Dry Hop is a great strain for West Coast IPAs and East Coast IPAs, to be honest. Uh, it really pushes a lot of the nice fruity aromatics of the hops very well. And last but certainly not least, if you want to have an IPA that has a little bit more residual sweetness at the end of it and maybe a little bit fuller mouthfeel, uh, then I would look for a English strain, actually. One of the same types of yeast that you would use to ferment a New England IPA with, in fact. Something like Conan Strain or the SO4 packet from Fermentis or maybe the London Ale 3 strain from Weiss. Any of these options are going to give you a slightly less attenuated beer. You're going to want to ferment this one colder if you choose to use one of those yeasts though because you don't want too much of that fruity expression of that yeast um, unless you're really going for that. But in my case, I'll be using a pretty clean American Ale strain that's just going to crush through the beer um, and leave a pretty well attenuated beer at the end of the process because that's what I want out of it. The other thing too to think about is the dry hopping step. So when you add dry hops to the beer, it adds a, a couple different risks. There's obviously the risk of oxidation. So you wanna be very careful when you add your dry hops uh, that you do so in a way that minimizes the amount of potential oxygen that gets into the beer. If you wanna see a couple different methods and how to do that, check out this video here. On the other end, you also have the potential to create something called hop creep. Hop creep is what happens when enzymes that are present in hops end up unlocking additional sugars for the yeast to ferment in the brew. This causes the yeast to actually actively re-enter fermentation. It also causes diacetyl to be made. And if you package your beer too early after dry hopping, you can often have hop creep show up a couple weeks later and end up with the diacetyl bomb in your hands. A good way to avoid this is to have a diacetyl rest uh, after you remove your dry hops just for a couple days to help the yeast clean that up or to dry hop at a colder temperature where the yeast are not actually uh, going to be actively fermenting. The last thing to be aware of is that adding dry hops will always present a risk of adding a grassy undertone to the overall flavor of the beer, especially with a larger amount of dry hopping. You typically run this risk if you leave your dry hops in your beer for five to seven days or longer. Uh, usually once you hit that five day mark, uh, that's when I recommend pulling your dry hops out and either packaging your beer or letting it sit and condition for a bit longer. But anyway, in a nutshell, what we will be doing is fermenting this beer at about 65 to 68 degrees for probably about two weeks. Um, I'm gonna add my dry hops probably around like day 10 or so and remove them after five days. And then I'm gonna let it sit in condition for another three days and then add it into my uh, keg and package it in cold crash and uh, serve as usual. I'll probably add some sort of cold side findings to this, probably like a gelatin or something in order to clarify it as it gets ready to be served. Anyway, I'm really excited to see how this beer turns out. So I'll see you guys in a few weeks. Final gravity on our West Coast IPA ended up a little bit drier than expected at about 10.08, uh, but overall, not too bad. All right, so it is now time to taste this beer. Um, and I gotta talk to you about fermentation because uh, we had a little hiccup 
Most of the time with the beers that I make, fermentation goes pretty much to plan, but sometimes they don't. And this was one of those times. I like to use USO5 a lot because it's a very forgiving yeast, and I would like to uh, use this beer as an example of how forgiving of a yeast USO5 is. So once I pitched the yeast, I started fermenting at about 65 degrees. I was using my anvil bucket fermenter and my anvil cooling system, which works great and was doing a great job at keeping the beer at 65 degrees. Uh, the way I use the anvil cooling system to keep my beer fermentation temperature under control, I like to use a cold water bath in a dorm fridge where I run the lines for the cooling system through the door and it, it circulates cold water through the cooling coil and back into the, uh, the ice water bucket in the fridge. And that works really, really well in most cases. However, I ended up taking a trip down to Cape Cod for a couple days, um, at starting on about day three of fermentation. So when I got back, it was day seven of fermentation. I came in to find my Inkbird temperature controller showing me a readout of 77 degrees Fahrenheit inside the fermenter. And that is way too hot for fermentation uh, on an American IPA, and especially with a yeast like USO5. Turns out that somehow the lines to my anvil cooling system had frozen and no water was passing through them. I suppose that's one of the advantages of having a glycol chiller. So I cleared the ice out of the lines, I restarted the flow of the water through the tubes and I let the fermentation sit at 68 degrees, carefully managed this time, uh, for about another week on top of that. The beer was tasting a bit weird, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. Uh, but I decided to move forward with the brewing anyway. I threw in my dry hops, and that's probably what saved this beer. I let the dry hops sit in there for about five days, and then I transferred it into the keg, let it condition at room temperature for another two or three days, uh, just to get rid of any diacetyl that might be caused by hop creep, and then tossed it in the kegerator to condition and chill in there for another week or two. Turns out this beer's actually not bad. And I was really, really surprised that with a 77 degree fermentation, I'm not getting fusel alcohols. I think what happened was I probably missed hitting that danger zone in the first two or three days of fermentation, uh, where if it gets too hot, you can really create some nasty off flavors. But because of the dry hop and because of the sheer amount of hops that I actually threw into this beer in general, and because of just generally how forgiving USO5 is of yeast, it was able to clean itself up over those last uh, couple weeks that I let it condition out. And I think that kind of saved the beer a little bit. So bottom line is, if there's any flaws in this beer right now, it's probably due to my brewing process. Um, this is probably not the best example that this particular recipe can generate simply due to the fermentation issues that I had, uh, but it still made itself into a pretty damn good beer. So I think it's time to go ahead and taste it. So the beer is called Catatonic State and it comes in at 6.4% ABV and 79 IBUs. All right, so for appearance of the beer, it's pouring a really nice dark gold color. As I stated before, it's supposed to be totally clear, and it is. Uh, it has a really nicely structured head on it with some nice fluffiness um, and a good amount of head retention that sticks around for a long time, which is awesome. So now we'll go in for aroma. I'm getting a nice bit of maltiness out of the aroma um, and also a significant amount of cattiness and dankness. A little bit of berry. All right, so now we'll go towards the mouthfeel. The mouthfeel on this one's actually pretty light. Um, it's overall a very light bodied beer, but more than anything, it's actually very dry. You get a good amount of um, kind of minerality coming through as well. Um, it's got a little bit of an edge to it, but overall rather crisp in fact. Overall, I think the mouthfeel is actually right on point for this type of style. The dryness of it really does enhance the hops bitterness and uh, it makes it rather refreshing, especially in this heat right now. All right, next up of course is flavor. Mostly I get a grapefruit and a cattiness. Um, and that's all from that Simcoe dry hopping. Simcoe is one of those hops that's notorious for having that kind of, like, <laughs> for lack of a better word, cat piss aroma and uh, character, which it makes sense in this type of beer because it's kind of falls under that, it kind of falls under that category of dankness. And that is really uh, something that's characteristic of a West Coast IPA, they're dankness bombs. I'm getting some kind of berry in here too. I can't really put my finger on exactly what kind of berry it is. And I'm not sure if it's from the yeast or if it's from the hops. Uh, but there's also a nice little bit of a pine note. 
And then one of my favorite things about a West Coast IPA is that on, if you do them right, on top of it, there's a little bit of a kiss of a floral character. Um, just a nice light floral note on top of all of the rest of the hop explosion. The bitterness on this one is actually not bad. Um, for 79 calculated IBUs, it really doesn't taste like you would expect. Because of the type of bittering hop that I use, it's not like coming in and slapping you in the face and being super aggressive about being bitter. It is bitter, but it's not uh, a super aggressive type of bitterness. I'm really surprised at how not ruined this beer is despite that fermentation hiccup. Um, I'm not really getting any sort of detectable uh, off flavors here. If you had a fermentation temperature control problem, uh, most commonly you'd expect to taste a solventy fuel-like character. And that was definitely present in the younger stages of this beer. That's why I had to let it sit in condition for a long time before actually drinking it. But now those uh, fuel-like characters are gone. Uh, There's a definitely a little bit of subtle fruitiness in there. But like I said, because of the sheer volume of hops, I'm not sure if that's from hops or if that's from yeast. More than likely though, it's from the yeast. There's probably a little bit of a fusel alcohol in there still um, in that it could cause some issues down the road. However, uh, right now it's not too bad and I really am surprised as to how much this beer recovered. There are a few flaws with this beer right now um, and a few things that I would definitely have done differently. Most obviously I would have fermented at the proper temperature and gotten a little bit cleaner of a beer out of this. Um, and that's number one and that's in the recipe that's something you should always do and the circumstance that I had was kind of out of my control. I was outside and away from my place. Um, but if possible, I would make every effort to control that fermentation to keep it under 70 degrees if you can. Otherwise, um, you know, it's a little bit muddy, I would say. The, the hop flavors are a little bit confused, and I can't tell if it's a grapefruit thing or if it's a cat thing or if it's a, a dank thing. Uh, it's a little bit unclear, and I've had some better examples of West Coast IPAs that have really made some of those characters shine through in nicer ways. That being said, it's definitely a decent example of a West Coast IPA, and it's one of the better ones that I've made despite the fermentation hiccups. Um, I don't make them that frequently. They are a pretty good beer style, though. I actually really love the color on this beer. It's also got a really good balance of sweetness versus bitterness. Uh, and that's actually a very important piece of this beer style as well. And uh, I don't think I really changed anything about the grist. And, and honestly, the recipe is pretty good too. I would maybe, for my personal taste, remove some of the Simcoe and replace it with maybe something more like a Citra uh, or a Mosaic would go really well in this as well. Um, or maybe just some actual extra Columbus at the end of the boil because Columbus tends to be a pretty nice grapefruit bomb uh, when it's used at the end of the boil. So, um, yeah, a couple things I guess I would have done differently, but otherwise it's not bad. Bottom line is this beer actually turned out pretty good despite the issues that I had, and I think that should serve as encouragement to anyone out there who's trying to brew their first beer or their first IPA and isn't quite sure if, uh, you know, you have to have as much precision as we all talk about. It's best to always have as much precision and control as you can with the brewing process, but at the end of the day, if something goes wrong and goes sideways, always finish your beer out anyway, even if something goes catastrophically wrong like it did in my case, because it might just work out. Anyway guys, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more stuff like this. If you want to support the channel, there's a variety of ways to do so. Please check out the merchandise store that's down below below the description box where you can check out this uh, t-shirt as well as many others and uh, your purchase of those really does help out quite a bit. If you happen to be in the market for some home brewing equipment, I have a list of my favorite equipment in my Amazon store which you'll find linked in the description box. And last but certainly not least, if you want to support the channel, uh, on a personal basis I also have a Patreon which is linked in the description box as well. My current patrons are amazing people and without them this channel would not be where it is right now so I am grateful to all of you. If you want to follow me on more social media than just YouTube, you'll find me on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer, so feel free to check that out as well. If you made it this far, you really are my true fans, and I do appreciate you watching all the way to the end. So, until next time, cheers.